born in Waterbury, Connecticut, March 31st, 1949. My mother was Alice Raynone and my father, Leonard John Montori Sr. at St. Mary's Hospital in Waterbury, Connecticut. My mother always laughed. She would tell me a story. She said, I think when I was born, I weighed nine pounds, 11 ounces. And you know, usually when the baby's born, they, when they keep you in the hospital, like, three days or so and she said I was nine pounds 11 ounces and when I came home from the hospital after the three days I was nine pounds 15 ounces they called me the baby elephant because I all I wanted to do was eat and she told me she said she finally got a uh, a quart beer bottle and put a nipple on top one bottle wasn't enough for big Lenny you know yeah I, I was blessed I was blessed from the start being born into my family in Waterbury and it was a three-family house. My grandfather came to this country in the early 1900s and he came alone, got a job and got set up, found the house, then he sent for my grandmother, then my grandmother came. My grandmother came alone. She was this little Italian woman, four foot seven. She came here and then they had to manage to get her there from New York to Waterbury. But they managed it, they did this. They always liked where they lived because where we lived, you could overlook the down below, you know, the, the city like so. But it had like two acres of land and they made them all gardens. They were all gardens. We had probably 13, 14 apple trees, four pear trees, seven, eight peach trees that grew mulberries. People said, oh, you mean a mulberry bush? And I said, no, a mulberry tree. The Italians, they call them chivs. Apparently my grandfather, when he came from Italy, brought this as a stick and he planted it. Because in, in Italy they had these trees that grew the mulberries. And you know, to this day, I haven't been back there, but that tree still might be standing back there. Because I remember going with some pictures, looking from Google Maps and stuff. And it looked like down at that piece of property, that tree is still standing, which is phenomenal. It's gotta be like a hundred years old now. But anyway, uh, that's where I grew up, and it was a great neighborhood. I have a book, it was called Italians of Waterbury. And at one time, Waterbury, Connecticut, which was the brass capital of the world, it had more Italians per capita than anywhere in the United States. And it had a lot of hills, and I think uh, a lot of Italians settled there because it reminded them of Italy, you know, with the, the hills and everything. Yeah, it was a great place growing up. I know nowadays a lot of the old homes and Stores like my dad's store, the mom and pop stores are have closed down. Uh, there's all bars on the windows. A lot of the old, those big old, beautiful old homes are boarded up and, you know, crack houses. And it's sad where it went, but a little at a time, they're cleaning it up. And that's what makes me mad when people complain about Rutland. I said, they, they never lived anywhere else. They, they, they don't know what it is, you know what I mean? Uh, we have a beautiful town or city or hamlet, whatever we can call it, but I'm blessed to live here. I, I can't say enough about it. Growing up in an Italian household, you learn everything. A buddy of mine said to me one time, he said, boy, 
a tradesman and started that with you Italians, he said, because you do everything yourselves. My grandfather, uncles, and my grandmother, they did everything. I learned to do carpentry, electrical, plumbing, mechanic work. You know, not phenomenal, but I learned to be a survivor. I learned to make something from nothing. I always loved drawing, you know, I would like to draw. I was a doodler. I was always, you know, drawing something or making things. I loved to invent things. As a kid, I would take the toys apart. If I got something, I had to take it apart and see how it worked and then put it back together again. Yeah, you know, I love to work on a project, fixing things and doing things. I love restoring something. Photography, I love photography. Uh, I love taking pictures. And I probably got that from my Uncle Angelo, whose love was pictures and uh, you know movies when he bought his first camera in 1932. It, it's nice to have. I learned to cook and, uh, you know, I learned tastes. I always loved food. I mean, I, I grew up in a house that, I always say Italians don't eat to live, they live to eat. Everything is planned around a meal. My mom always worked in the factory, so at a young age I would cook. You know, I'd make stuff and I'd create things and I loved it because I watched my grandmother make things. And as a little boy, when she was cooking, she'd give me a project to do to cut the beans or to clean this lettuce or from the garden or the tomatoes. And, and when we made sauce and when we made pasta or you made sausage, you know, it, it, the Italians did everything by the moon. They went by the moon, just like the tide. When the moon was right, yeah, at a certain time of the year, that's when you bought the grapes. You made the wine, you made the sausage by the moon. They'd make these rings of sausage. My grandfather used to save broom handles and he'd have them all hanging from wire and they'd wrap the rings of sausage around there and they'd let them dry. And they'd make that in the fall when it was cold. They'd open the cellar windows so the air would come through. Then they would take the dried sausage and they'd cut them in lengths, you know, like about a finger length like that. And they had these big jars with big wide mouths they filled it up with the dried sausage and pour oil over it so it would be preserved in oil. You know, they kept them in the, the wine cellar and they'd be good all year. I mean, you'd go down there and have provolones hanging, the salamis and prosciutto hanging down. And my grandfather made his own wine. Oh, 250 gallons of wine a year he made, you know, so that was five, five barrels of wine. My grandmother, she baked bread every week. She probably made 12 loaves a week and uh, she had these big green bread boxes downstairs in the cellar. The flour sacks, we call them mopine. The flour sacks were cotton or linen. I still have probably six or seven of those mopines from back then. They're probably from the 30s, 20s and 30s. And I still have them to this day. And she would wrap the loaves of bread in them and they'd be in the bread box and go downstairs and. She'd tell me in Italian, Lenny, I'm feeling a little bit to the barn and go down and get a chunk of bread. You know, I go downstairs to get the loaf of bread. My grandfather would say, I'm feeling which he meant, you know, go get a jug of wine for me, bring it upstairs. It was always food oriented. She would take the peppers from the garden. She made her the tomatoes. She made tomato paste and her own tomatoes canned them. The sausage was homemade. The bread was homemade. The cheese was homemade. They made everything. They made it. They wasted nothing. They cooked everything on the pig but the snout. They wasted nothing. If they if they had stale Italian bread, they made they called it la cosal. They would take the bread, soak it in water, and then she would um, sprinkle it with black pepper, salt, and Parmigiano Romano cheese, and then uh, extra virgin olive oil. She would drizzle all on the top of the bread. It was delicious. Nothing was wasted. Nothing. 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 It was just beautiful times. So everything was always oriented around food. My grandmother had an old stove downstairs, an old Glenwood stove, up, gray and white up on legs, you know, those old stoves, which to this day, I still own it sitting in my barn. I have it up in the back. When I moved from Connecticut, I took that stove out of the cellar. That was after my grandmother had died and I was moving. She was a nice lady. My grandfather back in 1960, he had an opportunity to buy a place in Milford, Connecticut, uh, some cottages down at the shore. 
and it, he paid twenty thousand dollars, and that was a lot of money in, in uh, 1960 for three houses. It was a compound. They were shorefront in Milford, Connecticut. It had their own private beach that belonged to that property, and um, there was a cement bluff in front of the 16-room house that went out. It was 65 feet long by about 30 feet out, and when high tide came in, the water came right up to the steps. You walk down the steps, you're in the water, and the waves would hit the wall, and it would splash up onto the patio back there. I loved it. I mean, we went down there. They needed work, and we worked on it. The family, you know, my grandfather and my uncles. Um, I remember as a boy, my Uncle Joe and my Uncle Frank, I lived upstairs from him. He was on the, the first floor. He lived with my grandparents. My uncle had a, a, it was a 57 Chevy pickup truck. We would get in there, we'd load all the tools that we needed, and we'd get onto the beach. Probably took us about an hour to get there. But we would drive down there and we would bring food and dad jugs of wine and stuff. And we'd, we'd work all day, you know, like painting. And uh, I remember putting up fence or breaking the, you know, whatever, getting the stuff ready because you had to board up the houses for the winter and so on and so forth. In the springtime, you had to take all the boards down and stuff over storms in the winter with all the driftwood and things would make a mess. You had to rake out the beach. There was always a lot of work. But then I would go when school got out. I spent my whole summers at the shore. We would get out. Geez, I think we got I got out in May back then. But we would get out and then went back to school around September the sixth. And I remember it, it'd be hard for me to put shoes on because I'd be barefoot for the whole summer. And my, and my feet would be so calloused I could die out cigarette butts on you know with bare feet. I mean, it was a lot of fun. But that's what it was. You know, that you did everything. You know, you worked. So I, I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, but it, you know, because number one, it was family. We'd have a painting party. Everybody came. My grandmother would make big pots of sauce and pasta, and we'd, we'd all work and uh, together. And uh, it was just, uh, it was, it was wonderful times. You know, it was just wonderful times. I started out my kindergarten, first, second, and third grade was at St. Lucie's uh, Parochial School in uh, Waterbury, Connecticut. My father had the store, and my mother didn't drive, so he would have to like close the store, or if he had a helper, somebody to stay there, or my mom would stay there, just when they were still together, he would have to come and pick me up. And uh, that's when I had transferred to Mary Abbott School, which was right across from my father's store. But growing up at St. Lucie's in Catholic school, it was funny because we had the nuns and everything. Father Scoglio was the pastor of St. Lucie's, and he was he was an old timer, and God bless him, he was a character. When you made your first Holy Communion, you had to go to confession, and I remember the older kids would tell us <laughs> they would they, they'd say uh, when you go in there, you tell the priest to uh, say. Uh, you know, bless me, Father, for I've sinned, and, you know, name sins, and, and say, I had impure thoughts, and I did impure things, and, and we'd say, well, what do you mean, just tell him that, tell him that, and go like that, <laughs> we'd go in there, and you'd say that, and he'd go, what, what'd you do, and he'd come out, and grab you by the ear, he'd come into the confessional, and grab you, I didn't know, we're telling him, because the older kids said, say that, and we'd say, okay, okay, we'll say it, now we're cool, we're one of the older kids, it was just hilarious, again, it was an Italian parish, so there was some, um, Father Farina was the uh, the principal. Uh, there was Father Evan Pato, Father Evangelista, great guys. But I remember getting in trouble, and I think it was Father. It was Father Farino. He was a big Brooklyn Dodgers fan and loved the Brooklyn Dodgers. And I was like in third grade, and one of the kids, Harold Higgins, we got in trouble. He brought a dirty magazine like a Playboy or something, or Esquire, I don't know, it wasn't real hard, you know, but he brought it to school and the kids, we, we got caught with it, we were looking at it. He's showing it to the kids. And the nun brought us in by the friend's office and we had to wait. She said, you wait until he comes in, your, in the office. He was downstairs doing something. And she put the book on the, the desk, opened up to the centerfold, sitting on his desk when he came in, right? 
So he comes in and he sees that. And right away, you know, we're little kids. We're trying to act a little boy here. We're, we're going in for the big time, right? So his love for the Dodgers, right? Right away, I go, hey, father, how about the Dodgers? You see the game last night? Oh, yeah, geez, you see so so with the right zone. He starts over there and he goes, all right, get out of here. Don't let me see this in here again. He goes, don't ever bring nothing like that to school again. You should be ashamed of yourself. And that was the end of it. Yeah, going to St. Lucie's was, was something else. Of course, like in anything, the older kids are going to tell the kids stupid things. <laughs> I remember being afraid. I was like in second grade, and I'm waiting for my father to come pick me up. And you know, I don't know he got busy, or you know, Dad drank, so I don't know. Maybe he was off. He stopped at the bar on the way down. And uh, I remember waiting out there, and everyone went home, and they said the nun said, "You got to ride." And they said, "Yeah, my father's coming to pick me up." Well, he didn't come. And I remember being real afraid because I'm out there and I'm hiding around the corner. There was like a little inlet on the building. And I was so scared because the, there was a, a guy in the neighborhood in, in their St. Lucie's and he was a dwarf. Later in life, I found out the guy was a friend of mine's uncle. He was the nicest guy in the world. But as a kid, he looked odd. So they used to call him the monkey man. And they'd say he could climb the walls and He'll come up and get you in the second floor, and you know, and I'd be so afraid that he's going to come by and get you and stuff like it because of stupidity, you know, because of uh, kids. But then finally, Dad would come and we'd go up to the store and stuff like that. But then when I went to Mary Abbott, it was a whole different thing because I could run right across the street to my uh, dad's store. Mary Abbott was a little nicer because the majority of the kids were all from the neighborhood where the store was. But that was that. And then growing up, the kids that I hung around with, I mean, like my buddy to this day, Frankie Argenta, his grandfather and my grandfather grew up together as boys in Italy. And they came to this country and they were the best, best buddies. And so Frankie and I, we grew up together in Mary Abbott. We went through high school together. Uh, we ended up partners in a Crestport Country Club when we had the food concession. To this day, he and I are best of friends. When I went to high school, I went to Caner Tech, which was a technical school, and I took drafting, I took mechanical drafting. A good friend of mine, Harold Zakonini, who got rest his soul, Harold's not around anymore, uh, had a Vespa. And we used to go to school on the back of the Vespa, and Harold was only like five foot one, five foot two. And we'd go to school and somebody say, hey, Lenny, you bought a Vespa. I said, no, I didn't have it. That's Harold's Vespa. They go, oh, where was he? I said, he was on the front, you can't see him. But, so I, I ended up in the drafting shop, but, I wasn't a school kid. I was a dreamer. I mean, I guess if they tested me today, I had you no know, ADHD because I, everything bored me. You know, I, I like articles. I, to read a book, I would start with the first paragraph, then I jump down to the fifth paragraph, then I go to page six, then I go to page fifty, then I go to page a hundred, then I then I look at the lack. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's the way it was. But anyway, yeah, I would be daydreaming about doing stuff or building something or. Uh, things like that. But I had a high mechanical aptitude. It was a technical school, so I always scored very high on the mechanical aptitude tests. I was more for the math and the sciences and stuff. I didn't care for English and social studies and history. It was, yeah, it's okay, you know, but I could do the work. I just didn't, it bored me. And I was like, what am I going to do this for? So I'll never forget going into my senior year, my strength and materials course. Mr. Brown, his name was, I was failing going in. I mean, I had like a, I think I got a 10. I put a big zero at the top of the page. I drew a picture of Snoopy stuffing the big zero into a, a doghouse, like pushing it into the doghouse because I was bored. I'm like, I don't want to do this here, right? So anyways, when we were going to have our final exam, I was failing strength and materials. I was going to have to repeat the year if I failed that. And, uh, so I knew I had to learn it. So that night I went home. The guy who lived on the third floor also was a math teacher. He taught it. So I told him, I said, I got to learn the strength of materials. And he crammed. The next day I went through the exam and he said to me, Mr. Brown, he said to me, you know, Lenny, he said, you got the third highest mark in the room. 
And he goes, and I know you didn't cheat because there was nobody to cheat from there because nobody else scored like you did. And he said, so the bottom line was, you learned it finally. You knew what you were doing. So he passed me in the class. But, you know, I got through high school. College never interested me. I never wanted it. My mom, she really couldn't afford it, but if they would have found a way, I could have gone to, like, state college or something. You know, they had community colleges back then. It was funny because my first job I was working at a place and they were doing structural steel. So it was like all that stuff that with the beams and stuff. I had to use some of the stuff looking for beams. But then I went from there and then I took another job at Allied Control uh, and I was doing electromechanical drawing, drafting. And I stayed there for, I forget how many years I worked there. And but it bored me, I didn't like it. You know, I did the job. But it was, it was, I didn't like being in an office and just doing that, you know, so, uh, but I got through it and, uh, but then after that, I, I, I got out of there and that's when I went, I, you know, decided I wanted to uh, sell cars and that's how I got in the car business and then from there I went into the restaurant business. I was in Caner Tech, and uh, I was at a study hall in the library. Miss Burns was the librarian, an older woman, and we were in there, and you know, doing what we usually do, shooting spitballs and fooling around, <laughs> you know, rather than doing our, what we're supposed to be doing, but as long as we were quiet, we didn't get caught. And um, Mr. White, our history teacher, walked into the room and said, President Kennedy's just been shot. Miss Burns just like almost went down. I mean, she started to cry. Mr. White was crying. Everybody, all the kids, you know, all of a sudden became instantly solemn. It, it was like a, a veil uh, fell over the room. It, it just wasn't happening, you know, like how, how could this go on? Jack Ruby shooting Lee Harvey Oswald and seeing these things live on television. It just, it opened up a whole different look at life. For a young person, being a kid, uh, being an adult, everything changed, everything, it seemed like everything exploded. That's something you never thought about. How could this happen? The times changed. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. My uh, Uncle Pat Fitzpatrick, Zizzy Rose and Uncle Pat, they were like family friends, but they were always called, they were always our aunts and uncles. And uh, he loved Jack Kennedy. Oh my God. It was like the second coming of Christ, you know, and he worked for Scholes Manufacturing. Waterbury was the brass capital of the world in the 50s. Uh, we had Scholes Brass, we had Chase Brass, American Brass. They were all big, big manufacturing, and that's where all, you know, the factory jobs. And I mean, Chase Brass, I think was, the, the mill was two miles long. Scovels had put up this big sign. I remember it was up on top of the shop and it said, Scovels. My Uncle Pat, I think he designed and paid for that sign the way he was so proud of where he worked. We'd have to drive over there and see the sign, the new sign that Scovels put up. 
the letters must have been eight, ten feet high, you know, big signs and skulls and red letters that lit up red. But hey, he cried like a baby when Jack Kennedy died. I remember the sadness and uh, it was like he lost a family member, you know, and, and he, oh, he was the best, you know, and I, I missed my Uncle Pat so much. up my sister was four years older than me so the music that she listened to Elvis Presley and stuff like that I loved that music because even as a boy I was in the fourth grade she was in the eighth grade and I, you know all the, the music that she liked the rock and roll coming up I really appreciated that that's where it started in our house on the third floor the tenants that lived upstairs Marilyn and Ed, they were older than me, of course, but they always had jazz. I would go upstairs and hang around with Ed. Marilyn worked for uh, Mattituck Music, and uh, I really started listening to a lot of jazz, and that's at a young age, too. <laughs> Mattituck Music was a record shop, and the old record shops back then, they had a, a booth where you could listen to them. So you get a 45, it was like a little bigger than a phone booth. You go in and shut the door and you could go in and listen to the record. But as I got older, I loved Motown. I remember in 1967, I bought a, a KLH stereo. And back then, that's before KLH was bought by Singer, but it was phenomenal. You know, turntable, tuner, speakers, 300 something dollars. But I remember it was phenomenal sound. Then, of course, coming to the Beatles and stuff, growing up when the Beatles hit, uh, it was big. I loved Rolling Stones and the Beach Boys and you know all the usual ones of that era. Uh, I have a, uh, when Susan was sick, one of the nurses, the hospice nurses was our age, and she made a uh, couple of uh, CDs for Susan. To this day, I have it at my, in my car. You know, I listen to it quite a bit. And yeah, I enjoyed that. Some days I'll have opera, and I love blues. You know, old whiskey blues, uh, Bessie Smith, T-Bone Walker, Lightning Hopkins, uh, Billy Holiday, Nina Simone. I, I love the old blues and stuff, and uh, those uh, blues singers. Shoot, 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 shoot. I love acapella. I love uh, some like the Persuasion, Street Corner Symphony. That was a great album. In swing, I was into swing for a, a long time. I had a lot of the big band sounds and stuff. And then, you know, in the 70s, all the disco and stuff. Matter of fact, I was listening to the other day. I had the Pointer Sisters going in the car. I was listening to it. I'll, I'll just pick up all different ones I love. But yeah, I love music. I remember uh, Susan and I talking one time. She said that I can't picture life without music in it. It's true. Yeah, music is important. I love I love my music. Growing up, I remember because of my age, in the 50s, you know, our TV, we had, you know, the small little round screen. God, I don't think it was uh, 11 inches. Black and white. But you'd sit around there, and there weren't a lot of shows, but we would watch the Ed Sullivan show and the Three Stooges, Amos and Andy, uh, Abbott Costello. Those were all great TV shows. My grandfather, they spoke broken English. They were beautiful, you know? I mean, uh, son of a bitch, you're gonna watch the wrestling on television. And he loved wrestling. But I grew up in the days with Bruno San Martino, Antonino Rocco, Bobo Brazil, uh, Haystacks Calhoun, all the old wrestlers. And my grandfather and I, we would watch the wrestling together on Channel 5. But, you know, there wasn't a lot to choose from. So whatever you watched, you were happy if you got the channel. Sometimes you'd be up on the roof trying to turn the antenna, like, you know, loosen the thing and try to turn it, wrap some tin foil around the rabbit ears. You know, we tried it all, you know, but because um, you had Channel 3 and Channel 8, sometimes you get Channel 5 or 11 out of New York. And having an older sister, there was Connecticut Bandstand and American Bandstand and, uh, which, you know, of course, you always watch Dick Clark and 
it was funny, you know, the uh, Connecticut band said was more local guys. And some guy, uh, he'd say, uh, yeah, yeah, it was nice. It was kind of easy to dance to. Uh, I won't buy it because I'm cheap. I don't buy records, you know, <laughs> guys like that. But I mean, it was funny. Those, But those guys stuck out in my mind. Like I said, it wasn't the selection we got nowadays. But Saturday, you got up and you watched Roadrunner and Daffy Duck and Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny and uh, Casper the Ghost. I mean, those were the old cartoons that I watched. Roy Rogers and Day 11 and Howdy Doody Show. And uh, those bring back a lot of memories. Great, great things. It was always a lot of fun. My father had the grocery store, and it was a butcher shop, and he always had a rack of comic books there. They were like 10 cent comic books. My sister always had all the Archie and Veronica and all those, and uh, but I mean, I had all the Superman and uh, superhero ones, and Casper the Ghost ones, and Woody Woodpecker, and as you know, a young boy, and stuff like that. But I'd come running through the screen door at my father's store, right to my uh, left as I ran through the door, was the Drake's coffee cake stand. He had all the Wonder Bread and the Hostess cupcakes and stuff. And I'd grab a devil dog or a package of uh, Hostess cupcakes or snowballs on, on the way to the candy counter. And then I'd go in the back and I'd wait on customers at the deli and uh, I'd slice the cold cuts for them. And uh, back then, American cheese, 35 cents a pound. Bologna was 39 cents a pound. Boiled ham, 45 cents a pound. 22 cents for a quart of milk. You know, loaf of bread was like 17, 18 cents or something. Then we sold candy, Italian ice. It was right next to the school. So I would go over at lunchtime and I'd go over there and I'd wait on the kids. I'd sell the penny candies. and. Matter of fact, some were two for a penny, like the Red Hot Dollars and Italian Ice. I'd go scoop the Italian Ice, Nicholas scoop. 10 cents, you got two scoops. 15 cents, you got three scoops of Italian Ice. After the lunch rush, you know, when everybody was on their way home to eat lunch, they got their candy and stuff that they wanted. I'd uh, go in the back. My dad had a little electric hot plate. Him and I would uh, cook. There was a place, Coney Island Lunch. It was down on uh, Bank Street in Waterbury. They had like a meat sauce, so we would make them at the store. And we'd make a meat sauce and make a relish or something and make an onion sauce. And growing up, that's that's where I got the love. I always used to make, you know, the nice homemade toppings. So when my friend Reggie asked me about the, the hot dog thing, I was like, yeah, buddy. And that's when I started making my relish and, and so on and so forth, you know. That was, uh, you know, part of my life growing up. And I, and I loved those days with the store and stuff. Dad got rid of the store in uh, 1963 because all the big stores were opening up and. He was a neighborhood mom and pop store, you know, when people didn't have the money, they come in, hey Lenny, you know, I need a loaf of bread, quart of milk, a uh, quarter of a pound of boiled ham, and uh, you know, they charge it because they didn't have the money. But when the big stores opened up, they went and bought their big orders down at the big stores. My poor father, when he uh, closed the store, there were people that had 200 $250 on the books you know, and it killed them, you know what I mean? Because they weren't paying it. I mean, a lot of them were good, but there was a lot of them that they owed money. But that's, that's what happened. Dad was a good man, but he had some demons. He had a drinking problem. He'd get abusive to mom and a black eye or cut nose and, mommy, what happened? She said, oh, honey, uh, mommy walked into a door, mommy fell, you know, and I grew up thinking my mother was clumsy. What did I know? If I was older, it wouldn't have happened. He and mom got divorced when uh, I was seven years old, but, um, 
you just don't understand. You know, all I, I remember my dad coming to the house and all his stuff was out on the sidewalk and I was sitting on top of the pile and crying that, you know, what, where are you going? You know, like you're seven, eight years old and how come your dad's not home no more? You know what I mean? And uh, I didn't understand. See, I didn't know until later after my parents got divorced, you know, what was going on. He had visitation rights for us. My sister and I would go with him on Sundays. I didn't really realize a lot of the stuff, you know, because you were young. And I would go with him and it was fun. He would take me to my cousin's house and uh, my father's side and I'd see them and he would go to like a uh, Salmon Rock amusement park or uh, to a movie or different things. But then there was also every week when we went, part of the, the trip was hitting all the bars. You know, I mean, he'd stop, he'd go from bar to bar to bar and uh, not all the time, but a lot of times it was. So we would go and I would sit at the bar and Kelly's bar. You give me an order of French fries or drink the birch beer on tap. Oh, it's delicious. I played a bowling machine. I love to play the bowling machine. So that's what I did. We went from bar to bar and then sometimes we'd end up going to a strip club. You know what I mean? And I remember there was a place on Maryland Road called the headquarters. They had a tank outside and I always thought that was wonderful. in a, an apartment that was upstairs from a bar. It was like out of a movie. Neon sign outside the window and it blinking on and off. I'd sit there and he'd pass out and we'd sideswipe the car on the way home, you know, over there. And, you know, he staggers up and I go upstairs and, and I'm there and he, it didn't have a bathroom. You had a bathroom in the hall they shared for all the apartments. And, and then there was another one on the third floor. I remember one time I had to go to the bathroom real bad and I went out into the hall. I'd be afraid because you're only a kid, you know, you're like eight years old. I go out there and there was somebody in there or wasn't working or something. And I had to go upstairs to the third floor. And uh, I was so afraid, and then, but I did it. And I came back downstairs and I you know, went inside and I, I'd sit there and sit there and I'd try to make some noise once in a while. Maybe he'd wake up. He's out cold and I'm watching this little black and white TV he had and it, it was all static. He not, so I'd have to sit there and wait for him to wake up to take me home. It might be three, four hours. Parts like that were mm, not, 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 not the best. But um, he loved me, you know, he was never abusive to me or anything. Yeah, as you know, my sister got older, she stopped going with him. And, then I found myself, you know, as I was getting into being a teenager and stuff, you want to be with your friends, and I, so I'd go, oh, I can't come, I'm going here, we're going there, and so I wouldn't go, and uh, he got sick of it, you know, I mean, I, I didn't want to go because it was the same thing, he was going to be drinking, and but he was a good man. I think I got a lot of my sense of humor from my dad, too, so was my mom, and my gift of gab from my dad, he was a character, you know, he was definitely a character. A good guy, but he had demons. Not that we drifted apart, but even when I moved up here, I mean, I would call him once in a while, but sometimes it'd go months and I wouldn't talk to him. But when I would call him, I mean, he loved you to death. And I always say goodbye, he'd say, don't say goodbye, so long, son. As he got older, he ended up drinking himself to death. He died in 82. He never say goodbye, just so long. Uh, tough but it was it was fun you know I mean it was fun growing up because I had the love of my family and my mom and my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and uh, I give my mom a lot of credit boy she raised us kids she worked third shift in a factory for 38 years we always had nice food and nice good clothes and she took real good care of us brought us places you know where she could afford but all the cousins and stuff she always took us to the ice cafes and Peabody Museum and it was a beautiful life because I had my grandparents downstairs. I grew up in a house full of love. We all sat around the table and uh, 
all the cousins came and the aunts and uncles and we all ate together on Sundays homemade pasta and roasted chicken and potatoes and veal cutlets and chicken cutlets and big trays of food and it was beautiful and then the kids would all go outside and play in the yard and uh, all the all the men would play bocce out on the lawn it was a close-knit community where I grew up all the neighbors were like family you know just beautiful 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 times growing up in, in, in that uh, that era and stuff you know I wouldn't trade it for the world I wouldn't trade it for the world those were uh, some good 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 times that's big Lenny growing up a little bit Some dogs. Hi gang, Big Lenny here, Big Lenny's Inside Job. Me and Wonder Woman today are going to be banging out some frankfurters down here. It's a beautiful sunny day, everything is shining out there. I'm telling you, life is nice. Look at that, you know, it's glaring through the window, it's coming through so much. Love you kids. He greets the peace. Wonder Man! No, that's Wiener Man. Wiener Man and Wonder Woman. Love you kids. I'm waiting for my baby every night at 12. She closes out the top and then we lose ourselves. At a hip, kind of hop in a crazy way. We're doing the bob till the break of day. Hot dog! She's my baby. Hot dog! Drives me crazy. Hot dog! Don't me maybe you ought to see my baby in a hot dog stand. Hot dog! She's my Happy Wednesday, Hot Dog Gang. It's me and Booba. We're going to be the Blues Brothers. Okay, that's it. How do you think of that? We got our shades on today, me and my boy over here. We're going to see. We're going down, and we're making some tasty food over here. Booboo's here every day. Put the chairs down. We're ready to go. I love you kids. Stop in to see me. Big Lenny's Inside Job. Increase the peace. in the, this restaurant, Crestbrook, it was a country club. He called me and his partner, you know, was drunk all the time and the guy was ruining the business. So Frank called me and said, Lenny, he said, would you like to be involved with this restaurant? You know, he said, you know how to cook. And I said, oh yeah, sure, I know how to cook. But I didn't realize when he said I know how to cook, I know how to cook for friends or family. You know, we're, oh, we're going to make pasta vazoo, we're going to make uh, lasagna, I'm making big stuff ziti. Cooking for a restaurant is different. Party of six, you got a party of two, you got a party of four, you got three deuces, and you know, you got chicken corn on blue, you got a, a rare uh, New York strip, you got the uh, shrimp scampi, you got scallops quarantine, and they all got to come together. Well, we take over the restaurant. I'm there, I'm, oh, I'm not a cook, don't worry about nothing, right? Well, we go there, the, the chef, supposedly the chef, you know, the guy's there, and I'm, I'm observing. I'm like a bull, you know, I'm 30 years old, I'm a young kid. So I'm, I'm in there and uh, 
this guy's cooking, and he's throwing the food on the plate, slopping it all up and everything. And I said, easy, buddy, here. I said, make the plates neat, you know, thin the edges, place it on there, don't make it sloppy. And he said to me, he goes, I'm the chef. He goes, you don't tell me what to do. And I said, I don't, do I, huh? I said, well, how's this? I sign your paychecks. And I remember at the end of the line where stoves were, the broiler, the stove, the flat top, there was a, a door that went out into the deck that overlooked the pool at the country club. And there was like a drop down to a bunch of bushes and stuff. I remember I grabbed the guy by the belt, by the back of the neck. I kicked the bar on the door. The door flew open. I went out the thing and I threw him right over the railing up to the bushes. And I said, and you, my friend, are done here. I went like that and I slammed the door. And my partner, Mike, comes in and he's going, where's the chef? We're all backed up out there. I said, don't worry about it. I said, I threw his ass out over the railing. I said, We're, I'm done here with this guy. And uh, I said, I'll take care of it. Well, it was like a madhouse. The orders are coming in. You gotta have timing. I didn't have, I knew how to cook at home. I didn't know how to cook like that. So I'm over there and I'm trying to, you know, keep up with the orders. And, you put them up on the slide where the heat lamp is, and I remember, come pick up your order, and I go to pick it up and put the dish up there, and when I pushed it over, the whole tray fell over, dropped everything, so I had to make it all over again. I was like livid, I was I was shaking, I was so, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. I remember there was a young kid working at a dishwasher, I said, get me a double Jack Daniels. So he, he gets shaking, he's afraid, he goes running out, he goes back with the Jack Daniels, I throw it down, they say, go get me another one. I threw that down. I remember I punched the wall so hard that my, you know, like I said, I was a gorilla. I punched it so hard, it went through the sheetrock. Thank God I didn't hit a beam because I would have broke my wrist. It went through the sheetrock and come through the sheetrock on the other side of my arm. Well, anyway, long and the short of it, I struggled that night and got through it. At the end of about 10 days, I was doing 100 dinners on a Friday night. And I had it nailed down, I had the timing down, I had it all down. And it's just that, that's how I learned. It was a hard box. I got thrown into a mess and I, you know, you put your nose to the stone, you don't quit and you just go for it. And that's a good thing in life. You know, kids should learn that there. You just push through things, you know, don't say, I can't do this. You know, it's like, don't give up. You know, I will do this. And, and that's how I got through it. And that's, that's how it went. and uh, I went to work at another Italian restaurant. So I was working two jobs. I was working a regular job and uh, worked there in this Italian restaurant. That job went and then I went to work with my buddy down at uh, his other place was um, Judge Peel Office Supplies. I worked there, you know, like working on the floor and selling some stuff, making calls on people, selling office supplies and things like that. And, uh, right after that, we moved to Vermont. I, uh, I had met my first wife. We got married. We were living down in Connecticut, and it was the first year I got married in 79 and 80. We decided to move to Vermont. She wanted to go to Vermont, so uh, we came up here, and we used to come up on vacation. I used to stay at the Red Clover Inn or the Tulip Tree Inn, uh, so I got to know the owners around the Phoenix Schutz and owned the, the Tulip Tree Inn, and uh, Bonnie and Dennis Talagon owned the Red Clover. And we were up here camping on a vacation. We were over at Calvin Coolidge State Park in Plymouth. And uh, we were up in North St. Johnsbury. Guy was gonna hire me, as he had a manufacturing company. Guy had a machine background, because I worked in a machine shop too. I worked for Pratt Whitney Aircraft, and I worked for Benedict Manufacturing and stuff, so I knew how to run machinery and, you know, in the drafting, so he said to me, you know, I could use a guy like you for, you know, some in the office, some on the floor, you know, working. So he said, but I want you to realize we get six months of hard winter up here. There's no movie theater, there's no mall, you know, it's St. Johnsbury. So anyway, I said, okay, so I got the job. She went to the, the medical center up there and she was gonna get a job there. She was gonna get hired. But on our way back, we stopped at the Red Clover in Killington and I ran into Bonnie Talagnon and she said, oh, you're from Connecticut and you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh yeah, we were gonna come for dinner tonight. She said, 
weren't you a chef? And I said, yeah, I did. I worked at, you know, as a chef for a while and things changed because Bonnie said her husband was looking for an assistant. I ended up saying, okay. Two weeks later, we loaded up our truck and I moved up here. Once I got there, Dennis was like, didn't want to, it seemed like he wasn't sure. So I would wash dishes, I would wash the pots. I come in in the afternoon, I do a little bit of prep, peel the carrots, potatoes, and then clean up the dishes. He had a kid, Carl, who was working with him, and they put out the food. Well, I remember it was a night that was real busy. They were getting buried in there, and I'm just standing there. I'd go home at six o'clock. So I, I went behind the line. They said, well, what can I help you? Where are you at? So I jumped in. I said, tell me the rest, how you make it. So I want to be consistent, because consistency is important. So he told me what the way he wanted it. Boom, I'm banging it out and we're putting the food. We got through all the rush. So he said to me, uh, can you bake? And I said, yeah, give me your recipe and I'll, what you want done and I'll do it, you know? So then he, he said to me, okay, so start coming in. He's gonna put an ad in for somebody else to wash dishes and stuff. And I started right in. I was making the bread. We used to make the honey bran bread every day for the restaurant. We made the cheesecake of the day. It was a nice handwritten menu. It was a beautiful place to work. I mean, I loved it. And uh, I worked there for about six, six and a half years. I worked there until I moved on from there. From the Red Clover Inn, I left there and um, friends of mine, uh, Ron and Feeney Schutz, who owned the Tulip Tree Inn, they uh, were thinking about buying the governor's table. It was next to Royals. And I called them up and said, listen, I'm in if you want me for a chef. So I went there. They had a daughter and her daughter was getting older. And they said they didn't realize. They said it's you know a lot more than we had planned. It's a lot of work owning a restaurant. So uh, they were going to sell the restaurant. At the time, Royals was across the way from us, Royal Market. Al Delantash had just bought the market in Royals. Mark Reardon and uh, Barbara Boswick were managing everything, all the operations, the restaurant and the uh, the market and so on and so forth. It was a beautiful place, the Royal Market. And I went to work for them and I was, you know, doing the food downstairs. We had fresh meats and fish, like a deli. We also had the hot food line where every day we had a, a beef, ham, turkey, roast, a couple of starches, you had a potato, you had a rice, a uh, few vegetables, you'd have broccoli or carrots and different things. So people could come in, you could get a, a meal. Say you just wanted to buy a, a nice piece of cod and uh, you want to buy a, a side of scalloped potatoes and a side of broccoli and a side of carrots and you make yourself a salad with the salad bar, your beautiful fresh meat, the pepper steaks or uh, beef bourguignon or something over a rice. And you, we always had soups. You go home and you had supper. So that was nice, you know, and it was a beautiful spot. And they had Ashbell's was the restaurant upstairs. It was really a nice operation. Everything was, you know, a lot of good, talented people there working, you know, Mark and Barbara uh, were, were very sharp. And then, and then Al Bellantash was getting out and, um, you know, he gave me like two weeks uh, severance pay. And he said to me, he said, you know, Lenny, you know, we're gonna close the place or, or sell it. So I went to work for um, Little Naples up on the mountain, it was across on Route 4, across from Churchill's. I called Louis and uh, Luigi Giuliano, and I went to work for him, and I, I stayed there, I think I was there a good six years as well. Little Naples, beautiful Italian food, you know, nice wine selection, we always did a nice job up there. A lot of work, you know, in ski season and stuff, you worked hard. And then when I left there, eventually, but a lot of my hot dog kids, like his son, little Louie worked with me, and my friend Petey O'Carro had worked with me, and all the kids, I, all these kids, I knew them from, and now they're, they're in their 50s, you know what I mean? But uh, they were like 15 years old, these kids at the time, 15, 16 years old. And now Louie, he went on to the restaurant business as well. When I left there, I went to work at Savvy's Restaurant down in, uh, Rutland. I went down to work for Ronnie Sabatasso. 
So when I went down to work for him, uh, they were pretty much a sports bar, but you know, they did spaghetti, meatballs, stuff like that, but it was pretty much a lot of sports bar, men, you know, like fried foods, you know, uh, hot poppers and ribs and stuff like that. But I put started doing the nice Italian food there and doing Italian specials and stuff. We were really doing some numbers. That was a nice, you know, we had a nice thing going there. I stayed there, but uh, working my rear end off. But while I was at Little Naples, I had started the hot dog cart. It was a long day for me, you know. I, I started the hot dog cart, and, and then uh, Louie had Little Naples, State Street. We ended up that calling that Paisanos, and I ran that down there for a while. I was doing the food down at Paisanos, and then he had opened up a place in uh, Middlebury, where it's I think it's two two brothers or three brothers now. Middlebury. So I was up there cooking and I'd go back and forth. So I'd run the cart and then I'd come home, break down the cart and I'd drive to Middlebury and I'd, I'd be on the little tape recorder. I'd be making the menu up, specials and stuff, talking and, and, and you know what I had to do, orders and stuff. On the way up there, I'd get there and uh, open up put out supper, clean up, then go home and clean up all my stuff from the car and then start out the next day again. So finally a friend of mine said to me, you want to be the hot dog man or are you going to be uh, a chef? I said, you know, I'd rather be the hot dog man. But a after all of that, when I got done with Savvy's and uh, all those places, I had Taylor's Restaurant. I went in partners on that, uh, which didn't turn out the uh, the best. It was a lot of work and stuff like that. You know, sometimes we make foolish moves in, in life and uh, things just don't work out. Oh, and then I got involved in Vermont Maple Sriracha and I was also doing my uh, toppings. Big Lenny's uh, Sweep of the Bite Hot Relish and Sweet Red Onion Sauce and Vermont Maple Mustard and my Apple Cider Honey Mustard. Even now that I'm not doing the hot dogs, I, I'm still going to be making my sauces, you know, go to some little stores and sell them, and just to be a nice for retirement, you know, something to, to take it easy with and, and stuff like that. wife and I were together 22 years but not to knock but it was it wasn't I always said we brought out the worst in each other and Susan and I brought out the best in each other I knew Susan 40 something years 41 years when I first bought my house in 1980 we went to the animal shelter and got a dog and I adopted this dog it was a puppy and um Tom Bro, who ran the uh, Humane Society, I bought his house. Matter of fact, my house that I live in was Tom Bro's. He said to me, the people that own this dog, they had puppies. He's a veterinarian, and uh, they'll give you first shots for the puppy for free. So I, when I got the puppy, Jesse, she was a wonderful dog, I brought Jesse up, up there, and I, that's when I first met uh, Quincy Shaw was the vet and uh, Susan and Quincy, they were married. And uh, they had a little boy, Cody. Quincy and Susan were working out of their house in Pittsburgh. And I remember going up there, they, they rented a house there. I went there and I met them. And you know, he would work on the dog right there. And uh, so I just got to know them well. And we became friends immediately. As the house went on, and they ended up buying a house in Florence. They moved to Florence. But uh, Quincy was always my vet. He was a wonderful vet, brilliant man. So he would come to the house. My ex-wife always wanted a horse. So we had gone to Pond Hill and we bought a horse and Ryan was his name. He was a beautiful horse and he was a very well-trained horse. We had the horse 20 minutes. My friend Luella Day over in Ira, uh, she had a farm, 750 acre farm. Luella's passed on now, was a dear friend. She said, you know, you can keep the horse up at my farm. So we had the horse, we brought it up there. There was a, a, an area, it was all fenced in. She said, you know, you can keep the horse here. 
the horse wasn't there, like I say, 20 minutes. I'm back at work, I'm up at the Red Clover Inn, and uh, I get a call from my ex-wife uh, crying, saying that the horse was walking around the border of the fence. You no, know, like they do, they check their territory. And apparently there was some old fence that was down and was buried in the high grass because it hadn't been used for a while. And he got tangled in some barbed wire. And when he went to run, it just tore his rear to shreds. And he was bleeding profusely. So I had a run, rush down there. I said, we called Quincy. The horse's leg was brutal. I mean, he, it was, you know, he had cut an artery, it was squirting blood. It was a holiday. I think it was Thanksgiving or something. Quincy came, he worked on that horse for hours, stitching it up and putting it back together again. And um, it was, it, it got to the point where the horse couldn't stay there. So I had a, a little barn here, like a little garage. I built a, a stall inside the garage and I had to keep the horse in there because it needed so much attention. So I built this stall and the Quincy would come, he had to come by like every, almost every day, every other day, and he would have to braid the wound because it was so deep right to the bone because otherwise it would heal in the, you know, the wrong way. It, would, it had to heal from the inside out. So anyway, uh, it took a lot of work, but he showed me what to do on it. And he would come by and we were just, and I'd have to call there all the time. And I talked to Susan and I, at first, I always thought Susan was a veterinarian because she was so knowledgeable. Uh, but she was uh, she had worked for a veterinarian in their early days in Louisiana, where they lived in Louisiana for eight years. But I always knew that they came back this way. And then um, I knew her when she was pregnant with Kit, our youngest boy. So they were uh, dear friends. Quincy saved that horse's life. That horse could run like the wind after that. It had a terrible scar, but he was such a good horse until the day he died and uh, he died in my arms. I'd be out there holding him and, you know, he was on the ground and, uh, but Quincy, uh, he took care of our animals. He just a talented vet. But then their life went in different directions. They divorced and Susan would always come to the hot dog cart with the boys and uh, I've known those boys, you know, their lives. But I always, uh, I always loved Quincy and Susan. They were dear friends of mine. Their life didn't work as, as it should, as some marriages didn't, like my marriage didn't. But anyways, uh, when, when I got my divorce, my friend Luella, where we used to keep the horse, uh, was diagnosed with cancer. My ex-wife and I would go up to the farm and help her and with chemo and stuff. And friends that were friends from hers for years would go up there and Susan being one of them and Mary Jane Osborne being one of them. and. We all came together. I'd see Susan up there and she'd say, what are you doing? I said, ah, you know, it gets old, you know, eating alone and stuff sometimes. So I said, hey, why don't we get a pizza tonight and sit on the back porch and have pizza and talk about old times, you know? And she said, well, that sounds good. So I think she had been divorced like 10 years or so. And she came over and we had some pizza and uh, that was a lot of fun, you know? The next day it's like, hey, let's get Chinese tonight. Why don't you come over again, you know? And, so we were supper buddies, you know, and we'd, we'd hang out and uh, almost 20 years of a relationship that was grown over a beautiful friendship. Six months, I think, we were just, you know, hanging out together and doing stuff together. And uh, it was like 21 years ago on the 4th of July and Kermia's was having their picnic and I used to go help and cook, help Roger cook the food and do stuff. So Susan said, what are you doing the 4th of July? I said, well, I'm going to, out to the lake, Lake Dunmore. We were having the Caramia's picnic and you know, I always help out, do, help with the food with Roger. And uh, she goes, oh, that sounds like fun. I want to go. I said, well, sure, come, right? So she came to that and we always said that was our first date. But we just like friendships, hanging out and stuff. In that period of time, I mean, it was just like, I was, we were chomping at the bit. Our love for each other was growing more and more and more. And like I said, it was a, it was a uh, romance that was built on friendship. We just like, you know, just were deeply in love with each other. And uh, it just went from there. She lived in Florence and I had here and 
we would stay half the time at her house, half the time in my house, and then we finally moved in together here. And uh, we were like family. The boys were like family to me. They're like sons. I'd known them. I watched them all grow up. I knew them, you know, and everything. And uh, we had a beautiful, wonderful relationship together for 21 years. November of 2018, she wasn't feeling good and Susan researched everything and she'd say, oh, it's my histamine levels are off and this is off and, and I'd say, but you know, she was coughing. She had a dry cough for like six months and I said, honey, please look into that. She said, no, no, no. She said, it's nothing. It's just, uh, it's my histamine levels, you know, are, are off. And uh, I mean, two months before she was diagnosed, she's running in the field with the dogs. So finally in November, it was the end of November, she went to her doctor and he said, you know, I want you to get a, a chest x-ray. She went for an x-ray and I was working at the inside job. I had just started and I was working there, it was like nine months. And uh, she called me and said they they found uh, they found some uh, spot on my lung they don't like and they, they want to uh, do a CAT scan. I said, okay. She went the next day, she went for the CAT scan, and it was like on a Saturday. It was about three o'clock, she called me and said, the hospital just called and uh, she said, I have cancer. She said, uh, it doesn't look good. I said, I'll be right home. And I closed the shop and I went right home. That was the last time I had the business open. Turned out we met with the pulmonologist and uh, went into uh, the office there. And uh, I didn't like, you know, when, I, when we walked into the room, there was a little round table with a laptop on it and three chairs. And uh, my stomach turned because I said, this doesn't look good. I didn't like the setup. And uh, we're sitting in the room and a doctor came in and said, um, he sat down and he said, what you have is a uh, stage four metastatic lung cancer. And he said, he said, he showed us the x-rays and he said, there, there's darkness around the heart. It's uh, the tamponade, which is very, uh, it's rare, but uh, it's fluid buildup around your heart. And he said, you have two choices, Dartmouth or Burlington. And she said, I want it here. And he, he said, we're not set up to do this procedure. He said, what you have is very serious. And it's got to be done, and we need it done stat. He said, you can keep going, but it, this is going to kill you. He said, you know, you, you have no choice in the matter. It has to be done. But we said Burlington, because Cody was living in Colchester, so we figured Burlington would be good if you know, we needed the kids are close. So he said to me, uh, well, we have to get, you know, an ambulance and, and bring her up to Burlington as soon as possible. And within 20 minutes, there was an ambulance there. And um, they were loading her in an ambulance. And um, I remember going out to the garage where the ambulance pulls in and they load her in. And I'm watching her leave. And I'm thinking to myself, this whole world is falling apart. I don't know what's going to happen here. I didn't like the idea of it. She went there and talked and uh, that night they drained fluid off there and she called me and geez she felt she sounded so good she sent me a picture of selfie and she said oh honey she said I can it's so good I'm breathing good and so I said oh thank god you know that you got there in time and everything and she was doing well and 
it was like a few hours later, she texts me and says, I'm afraid God's closing his eyes on me. And I said, what do you mean? She said, now my lungs are filling with fluid they're telling me. And uh, it wasn't good, but they were working on her. And finally, they said they, she was there for about five, six days. So I remember talking to the cardiologist and stuff. And I said, well, what do I need to do? They said, we're going to send her home. I said, uh, well, do I need a hospital bed or anything? And they said, no. I said, well, our bed's on the second floor. And she said, well, I think, you know, it'll be fine. She takes her time. She would, she used to sit on the steps and go upstairs one at a time to get upstairs. But she, she cried so much when she came home. She was just so happy to be home. Little at a time, she was getting better and better, you know, and they, you know, she said, well, then they were gonna start the chemo. So we started the chemo. She was having a tough time with that at first a little bit, but she was getting better. Then they came up with uh, this, there was a couple of experimental drugs that they wanted to try, but one of them, they said, could cause blindness, it could cause this and that. And she said, uh, no, I'll, I'll stick with the chemo. Well, they decided they were gonna change and go to Keytruda. And Keytruda apparently it trained your immune system or something to attack the cancer cells. So your own body fights the cancer cells. But she wasn't doing well with it. So she started reading about it and she read that in some cases, Keytruda will attack all your major organs and certain people. It's rare, but it would happen. And um, it was attacking her organs. She came back, we had to rush her by ambulance again. She had to have her, they had to put a drain in. And once they drained the, the fluid from around her lungs, she was doing good. It was Christmas of 2018. She spent in the hospital. This was like a month after she was diagnosed. It was terrible. I mean, it was just terrible. They said that it was, uh, she didn't want to have the, this other procedure done, but they said, you have to go on thinners. He said, otherwise you're going to be dead. And uh, so they, they put her on this heparin drip and the heparin, it, it, was, it was like miraculous because she was getting blood clots in her legs. She, when she was rushed to the hospital. Her leg was getting hard and it was twice the size of the other leg. And she had a blood clot from the bottom of her foot up into her abdomen. They said, we're going to try to dissolve this blood clot with heparin. If we can't, uh, we can put this thing, it's called like a filter or something, in case part of the blood clot lets go. And it was just terrible, I mean, what she went through. But, you know, she was tough. She was tough and she got through it. She was like a tiger. She was she was pulling out of it. I mean, she started getting better again. We were at Christmas time. I I was there and we, we spent our Christmas up there. The kids came and our grandson, Nikki, was up there. and. She was so happy to see everybody and, you know, and you'd never know two days before or day before that she was like, I, I thought she was heading for the last roundup, but she had the heart of a lion. It just kept going. And uh, when the, she came back that after that, then I had to get a hospital bed for her. But she didn't want a hospital bed. She said, I want a regular bed. So upstairs we had, we have a king size bed, but we had a, a little uh, a double bed on the second floor. So I took that downstairs and I fixed up the living room. Nice, with all the flowers for her and everything. And when she came home, she cried because she was so happy to be home. And it was so beautiful. We had it for her. She could watch TV. She had the, the animals there, our dogs and cats. So she was doing well. And she, she was, you know, the chemo, she went back to the chemo and stuff. But then the chemo, down the line started affecting her, you know, the following year it was, uh, she ended up having a heart attack and we had to have her flown by helicopter in the middle of the night to Burlington. And uh, that was a couple of months before she passed. And uh, everything was just getting worse and worse. Right till the end, you know, she just, she would tell me, you know, she said, no honey, I'm, I'm dying, you know that. And I said, no, you're not, you're gonna get through this. We'll get through it. She said, I don't want you to worry about you. She said, I want you, I want you to find someone that loves you the way I love you. And you love them the way you love me. I 
I had a hard time that first winter. I, I after she passed, she passed October 2019, the 25th. She just her little body couldn't take it no more. And I remember I would sit upstairs and look at her picture, talk to her at night, and say to her, "You know, honey, I said I'm working hard at this, but." I'm not going to make it. I said, I'm going to be seeing you sooner than later. I said, my, I just can't go on. I ended up with, you know, having to, through all of that, I had had those debts in my heart because they had a blockage. I thought I was run down from helping her, taking care of her. And they uh, put four stents in me. And then I, but I always, you know, to take care of her. That's all I worried about. The boys would come here and the kid took time off from work. Cody took time off from work. And they, came, we, we circle the wagons the way you're supposed to do it. Everyone comes to help you and cares about you. Then after uh, a couple of weeks go by, they have to worry about their own lives, you know. And uh, After she had passed, I was just, it was a struggle. Don't cry for me, don't shed a tear I've been set free, no need to fear God spoke to me, my time had come He made a way to bring me home Don't cry for me, my pain is gone forever cry for me I'm well within my soul my pain is gone please understand my passing was in God's great plan I'm with you still each day and night just close your eyes I'll hold you tight don't cry Don't cry for me, my body's been made whole. Don't cry for me, we'll soon be back together. Don't cry for me, I'm well within my soul. I'm in your heart, I feel your pain. Don't give up hope, our love remains. I'll wait for you at heaven's door. We'll meet again one day for sure. Don't cry for me, my pain is gone forever. Don't cry. I'm well within my soul Don't cry for me I'm well within my soul In the cool of the evening when the sun goes down All the cats and chicks all gather round They are the hot dogs Soda pop, then they head downtown to a hip cat hop. Hot dog, she's my baby. Hot dog, drives me crazy. Hot dog, don't mean maybe you ought to see my baby in a hot dog stand. Happy Friday, gang. Big Lenny's eyes are popping out today. Listen, I wore the crazy glasses because I got everything you need. 
I love to see you guys. Don't forget, gang, I got the mini meatball parm stuff for five bucks. You get hungry, stop in to see us. You get lonesome, stop in for a hug. I love you kids. Big Lenny with the crazy glasses, looking up in the air saying, woo hoo hoo! Love you guys. Happy Friday. I'm a waiting for my baby every night at 12. She closes out the top and then we lose ourselves. Had a hip, kind of hop in a crazy way. We're doing the bop till the break of day. Hot dog! She's my baby. Hot dog! Drives me crazy. Hot dog! Hey gang, happy Sunday down here. Big Lenny, the Hot Dog King, was broadcasting live from downtown beautiful Rutland, Vermont, 56 Bronx Avenue. Look at the gang we got going on here. Look at there, I got ketchup, I got mustard, I got a hot dog roll, I got Wonder Woman back there. Big Lenny's inside job, look at those happy faces down there. Wave everybody, crease the peace, we love you down here. was getting to me and my I, I, I was going for counseling I called her to talk doctor she's a sweetheart said to me you need to get into a grief group Lenny and uh, I remember joining a grief group it, it was a big help it changed my life you know meeting other people that were going through the same thing I was going through it, it, and, and Susan would say to me honey I want you to get organized because I'd say well I'm not that organized a person you know and She'd say two weeks before she passed, she said, promise me you'll get organized. And I said, I, I will, I, I'll get them. Um, there was a girl, Katie, that worked for us at the Sriracha, and she it was a sweetheart, Katie, the organizing lady. She came and helped me organize some book work and stuff, and I'm truly blessed. It's been life-changing. Live a nice, simple life, drive some of the back roads, and uh, life was good. Walton had made a, a big, I had a six foot hot dog that was on top of my old cart and I had that hanging on the wall but it was all faded from the sun and my friend Norma Montaigne who passed away uh, last year, she was an artist and she was, Norma did a lot with the parade, the Halloween parade and the Kiwanis and she was very loved. Norma said, oh, she said, I want to I want to post that up for you, Lenny, as a gift for, you know, she said, let me put some color to it, add some toppings and stuff. She took it drooling hot dog with all relishes and stuff dripping off of it. She did that for me, and then she died in a car accident, um, and it, it broke my heart, but my sweet Norma, good person, she was a good friend to Susan, and uh, I'm so happy I have that big hot dog out in the barn. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'll have it forever. job happened uh, I was 69 years old and I was I was running the cart and the cart was a lot of work 
I wish I made the money people think you make, you know, having a car, believe me. They think it's so romantic, it's like the people that buy, uh, they come from down country and they buy a country in thinking that it wouldn't it be romantic to have a country in and they, uh, they don't realize the work that's involved. That was the thing with the cart, it was a lot of work. I mean, I'd be up at eight o'clock in the morning, I'd have to eat every day and get it into the car. There's only three stairs off the porch, but you gotta carry stuff down the three stairs, you know, the pants one at a time because they're full of hot food, put them in the steamer, get everything going, you gotta get your ice, your sodas loaded up, all the rolls, everything you need for the day. Open at 11, to close at four, but, um, I'd be working till seven o'clock at night to clean up afterwards. Seven, eight o'clock sometimes, you know, to do it right. Get all cleaned up, prepped up for the next day, shop and everything. You know, you're getting tired. I'd be going sometimes, you know, try to rush and I stumble and drop the pan and all the stuff spills. Now I got 45 minute cleanup before I can go to work. So I finally, uh, my friend Roger, you know, care me is, he said to me, he always called me old man. He said, hey, old man, you know, you're not a kid anymore. You're out there freezing, trying to open in the winter. You're, it's just too much for you. He said, why don't you get on the corner, talk to Joe Giancola. He's got that empty building down on the corner. Open up a place. He said, even if you just throw a push cart inside the building with a couple of picnic tables. You know, sometimes I say to myself, maybe I should have done that. But he said, no, you can put a counter here. You get this. And Roger gave me a lot of ideas and stuff. I went to see Joe, and Joe said, come on. He said, let's go up there. We went up to the corner, and I told him, I said, when I lived on Madison Street, I used to walk down here. I said, I'd stand across the street, look at this place, and I used to say, geez, I love that building. I said, I, I, I would love to own a little place in that building. And that building just, it spoke to me all the time. And um, you know, whoever thought years later, I would be there. It was just a shell that was empty. So I told him what I wanted to do, and he said, okay. So he said, well, hold on to the keys. You know, he said, you want to bring Susan down here to look at it and stuff like that. I said, okay. I had the keys for about two weeks, you know, and I brought it on and looking around and stuff. And uh, so I said, well, Joe, here's your keys back. I said, I just want to bring them back. I don't want to think I'm holding them on forever. He said, what, you don't want the place? He said, well, no, I do. He said, well, they keep them. He said, get going on this. Tell me what you need. Get going. I said, okay, and I was telling him what I had planned. I said, I gotta look for some equipment. I gotta look for this and look for that. He said, ah, you go to auctions. He's telling me, check with this one, check with that one. You know, as far as the Giancolas, I can't say enough. That family, I was blessed to have the Giancolas in my life. Blessed, all capital letters. Joe was so good to me. I, I think uh, if everyone was fortunate enough as I was, be able to go and spend the day, just spend the day with Joe Giancola. Spend the day with that man. He is an amazing man, an amazing man. So Joe called me up and it was like, he goes, hey, write this down. It was on Sunday night, I'll never forget it. And he was, he was out over someone's house for dinner and he said to me, here, you got a credit card? He said, call this company. He said, there's an auction. He said, and um, there, it's a uh, Quiznos, it's up in Essex. There's an auction now, it's going on. You got a bid on the stuff, you give me your credit card number. You got a credit card, he said, give him the number. Blah, 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 so I'm going, okay, okay, Joe. And so I'm looking online, I never bid online. I didn't know anything about it. Never been to an auction like that, you know? He goes, they got the counters, they got everything you need. So I figured, well, one of them was real good. I figured I better bid, you know, 200 for one section, 300 on one, I bid 400 on one, I bid 175 on the sections of the counter because they were, you know, they had a, everything you needed there. So anyways, I start bidding on the, he goes, they got tables and chairs, so I'm bidding on the tables and chairs, I'm bidding on the uh, neon signs, I'm bidding on all this stuff, right? And I'm bidding, you know, I'm, I'm going light on it. Well, anyway, I'm watching the thing and I'm watching and I'm watching and I'm watching it. He says, stay close because if somebody bids, you got to go right in with a bid quick on it. So I'm doing this. Well, anyway, it ends up the bidding comes over, no one bid on the stuff. I ended up paying ten dollars a section for all the stuff for forty bucks. I bought the whole line. I mean the tables and chairs. I think I paid fifty dollars for a table and four chairs, and I bought like twenty five chairs. It was just amazing, you know. I mean the, all the stuff. Joe was the king of um, auctions, 
So I got all this stuff, so now I gotta get it. So I'm, I'm trying to think, how am I gonna get it? Joe goes, listen, get a truck. I, I got one of his trucks with a uh, hydraulic lift. He sent four of his guys with me. We went up there, 20 minutes, we were in and out of that building so fast. I mean, I never saw any guys work so fast at what they were doing, taking all the stuff apart, loading the truck. We come back, and Joe just was, just, he treated me like gold. I mean, I, I couldn't, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they're family to me. Gene Colas will always, I'll always say, you're part of my family. so good to me and then when Susan passed and uh, you know he said you do what you got to do and uh, you know that place will be there for you and, and it came to the point where it was two years you know Lenny if you want to open David said to me we're, we'll help you everything we could do but if you, if you don't have it in you he said we got to rent this place and I said I fully understand I said for what I owe you guys uh, I said just take the equipment and uh, David said, that's good karma, Len. Maybe somebody could go in there. It can help a person open a business that doesn't have the money and they could get a good leg up. And that's what I did. And uh, it, it just, uh, it warms my heart. We went in there and we took every one of those pictures, the 500 of them down off the walls. And I got them all stored here in my garage. And every time one of my friends comes by and People I know, they come by, if their picture was up on the wall, I give it to them, you know, and say, here, you know, the memory of the place. Uh, again, I owe all that there to the Jane Colas. I can't say enough for what they've done for me in my life. But Rutland in, in general, I mean, it, it's just the people here have been so kind to me. I'm blessed to live where I live. You know, I'm just blessed to live where I live. And that's, that was that. I mean, that was the Big Lenny's. Uh, it was only nine months, really, where I was, having a lot of fun. I had some good help. I had uh, Joanne work. She was a retired school teacher. And, and Dawn worked with me. They were power. Uh, Dawn could, she knew the food business backwards, forwards, and she grew up in it. And uh, her son, Joey, helped me. And I had a couple of young people working there for me and, you know, different people working and helping me. and. Uh, I had a good crew, I had a good bunch of people. And I had the most wonderful customers, I mean, uh, loyal customers. And like I said, over the years, I would go down there even by myself after it was closed. I'd walk in there and I'd, I'd start to cry. sit there by myself and I'd put the oldies on the sound system and I'd walk around there and look and I'd start to cry thinking about um, look what I created from nothing and now I gotta walk away from it but you know what I'm one of the richest men I know for the friends that I have made over the years not monetarily, but 
for love and friendship. I'm a wealthy man. Good morning, Hot Dog Gang. It's Tuesday morning. Big Manny got the shades because the sun is shining. Let me tell you something. This one I put up the open flag. It's hot and muggy. Get up here and enjoy some of this cool air conditioner. We got it nice. Anyway, we'll see you down here. Big Lenny's Inside Job. Love you guys. Increase the peace. Well, there's nothing tastier that you'll find. It's gonna fill you up and it will blow your mind. And all the ladies clap their hands when they hear. Sure won't kill you. Well, as a matter of fact, it's guaranteed to thrill you. Now all the ladies understand when they see his hot dog stand. They call him hot dog man. 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 Yeah, he's the leader of the band. He's number one original hot dog man. He's got a hot dog man. He's got a hot dog man. So come and find me when the sun goes down. We're gonna have ourselves a party on the other side of town. Ain't it dandy? Ain't it grand? Ripping all night with the hot dog man. say my town because I I love it. I love it here. And I love this area. I love Vermont. Susan used to say to me, she was a native Vermonter, and she'd say, you're more native Vermonter than most native Vermonters with your love for this state and Rutland. And I've said it before, we get a bad rap sometimes when they had that uh, the thing about, you know, Rutland with the, the junkies and the drugs and the different things. And People say this and that about it. This is a beautiful community. You look and people now, they come from away, they live you know, down country and they, they come up here. Uh, there, there's people that have, you know, really, really appreciate what we have here. And then there's the ones that they come to this area and they want to build these big phenomenal homes, but then they, they want to change it all. You know, like, oh, you know, we need more of this, we need more malls, we need more of this, we need that, you know. 
why try to change it from what it is? We're a beautiful, homespun little place. And some of the young blood that's coming up in Rutland now, that's just wonderful people. There's just some great, great people like yourself, Ben. Everything is, it's, it's coming together. I just think it's so great that people, individuals, are, are coming together in this town to try to make this the best it can be. And, and they're doing a hell of a job. The downtown partnership, the uh, murals, the artwork, people like Joe Jane Cole and Mark Foley who are stepping up to the plate and, and making things to try to make something and more family oriented and people helping people. The good thing I think that came out of the pandemic was it brought people together, families closer together, and to keep doing the work we're doing here, and that's what it's gonna take. Unfortunately, our kids can't stay here in Rutland because there's not enough for them. They need to go away. But what I'm seeing is now kids in their 30s and 40s that went away, got their education, are coming back to Rutland. And they're coming back and they're taking part of the community because they appreciate what they had here. And they want to raise their families here in Rutland now. And I think it's the greatest thing in the world. And the thing I could say is, don't forget your roots. Don't forget where you came from. You know, I know there are a lot of problems. A lot of people have had a lot of heartbreak here too. But you know, moving away and it doesn't, if you had a problem here, geographical uh, move doesn't get rid of your problems. We need to work on ourselves. The more we work on ourselves and realize what we have and how to appreciate what we have, the better life is gonna be for us, for our families. Just be together and enjoy your family and your friends. And when you see them, tell them you love them. Life, sometimes it's over in a snap. Don't have regrets. Don't say, I should have done this or I should have done that. Do it. I'm saying to the parents, your kids run into a little trouble, they have a problem, don't abandon them, help them. Help these kids, help these kids because that's our next generation. That's who we got to help us. Make the best of life, make the best of life and just support each other. We can do this here, you know, I mean, I know some people, you know, the way the world, the world's changed a lot from when I was young, but I see it going in a good direction, I feel. Um, little at a time, I said it before, there's a lot of bad in the world, but there's still more good than bad, so don't sell it short. Let's, let's get those numbers up there. Let's get the good guys going, okay? Thank you, my friend. I can't thank you enough, Ben. I, um, I'm proud to be uh, to be thought of enough that that's um, people want to hear what I have to say. Um, it's uh, I'm honored. I'm truly, truly honored and to have you doing it because you uh, you have a way of just you know a nice way of doing it. When I look at all your documentaries that you've done and with Ray and so on and so forth and you're talented and uh, you you see a different side it's it's like you want to leave your mark and you're doing a great job of it and that's like me I being that the restaurant had to close and being that I went through some rough bumps in my road it happens but my legacy is going to be a guy that uh, that was loved because my love for people and um, for that I'm forever grateful. Every time I close my eyes you were on my mind Every time I close my eyes
love you too, baby. In the cool of the evening when the sun goes down All the cats and chicks all gather round They order hot dogs and red soda pop Then they head downtown to a hip cat hop Hot dog! She's my baby! Hot dog! Drives me crazy! Hot dog! Don't mean maybe you ought to see my baby in a hot dog stand Hey gang, Big Lenny from Big Lenny's Hot Dog You got a big appetite today, Saturday Stop, stop, ah, I got the hot dogs, I got everything if you got the big appetite, stop in. Hey, listen, gang, Saturday morning, Big Lenny, we got Big Martin today. Miss Dawn will be down here. Anyway, we're all down here. We're hanging out. Stop down to see us. We love you guys. Saturday, stop in. Big Lenny's Inside Job, 56 Strong Avenue. We love you, kids. I got a woo-hoo. All right, guys, see ya. I'm waiting for my baby every night at 12. She closes up the top and then we lose ourselves. At a hip, kind of hop in a crazy way. We're doing the bob till the break of day. Hot dog! She's my baby. Hot dog! Drives me crazy. Hot dog! Don't be maybe you ought to see my baby in a hot dog stand. Hot dog! She's my baby. Hot dog! Drives me crazy. Hot dog! Don't be maybe you ought to see my baby in a hot dog stand. Happy Thursday, hot dog kids. The shades are on. The purple's on. Look at that. Like Gilbert Grape over here with Big Lenny's on the front. Anyway, Big Lenny's inside job. Thursday morning, sun shining. It's nice and bright. I got a pot of potatoes on. Oh, I almost dropped the phone there, kids. I got a pot of potatoes on. We got it. You need it. Stop in and see us. I love you, kids. Increase the peace.